good morning. It's good to see you all here. I'm glad to be here too this morning. And welcome to all the visitors. We're really glad that you're here with us and can worship with us this morning. Um, this subject, I want to talk about contentment this morning. Um, this subject I've been thinking about quite a lot lately and even for the last last while. And I want you all to know that I'm first talking to myself about this because I've had problem in the past with this. I mean, I still struggle with it um, about, about being content. And contentment has nothing to do with our physical things and money. I, I, I want you to, I mean, I want you to know that too. Like, this is not about whether we are rich, whether we are poor. Um, we can be content in either whether we are rich or whether we are poor. A lot of times, our discontentment, um, it shows itself through the things that we buy or the things that we have. Um, sometimes our discontentment can show from that. Um, and also, I, I didn't want it all to be about that, the, the message today. But so many verses in the Bible about contentment, it brings that in about our finances, uh, our physical things that we have. And so I'm going to go over some of that stuff today. Um, the, the very first sin in the Bible was a sin of discontentment. You know, Adam and Eve in the garden, they had everything. You know, God had provided for them, I mean, they had, they had everything that they wanted. There was, only, there was only one thing that they couldn't have. And, I mean, they had, a, they had all the food that they, you know, that they could eat. I mean, good food, I'm sure. Uh, a beautiful garden to be in. They had one-on-one -on -one communion with God. I mean, it was just like, like us talking to each other. And, and it was just beautiful there. They had perfect health. But God took the one thing that they couldn't have, or sorry, Satan took the one thing that, they, that God had told them that they couldn't have and caused discontentment in their life so that they wanted the one thing that they couldn't have even though that they had so many other things that God had given them. Um, what is contentment? The uh, Webster's meaning of contentment means happiness and satisfaction often because you have everything that you need. What do you think of when you think of contentment? Um, I, I don't know, like, I'm a little weird, I guess. I, I think of a cow out in the pastures is, is one thing I think of when I think of contentment. Out there, totally satisfied, under a shade tree, I mean, that's that's, I guess, one picture that we, that we get sometimes. And so, sometimes we are like the other cows in the pasture, or goats are really good for this. They think the grass is always greener on the other side. You know, they're always, I'm sure that some of you have seen the picture of two goats. They're on, they're both trying to get the grass on the other side of the fence. And sometimes I think that's like us so much. I mean, we, we think that what we can't have is better than what we, than what we, than what God has given us. And we try to get that. Another, th another example of contentment, I, I think of a baby, you know, small children or babies. I mean, they're, they're totally dependent on you, but still they're completely content. Uh, you holding them and I mean, they have everything they need. They just, they don't need much, and they're totally content. I think, uh, too, that the number one reason for discontentment is by not realizing that everything that we have comes from God. And uh, when we know that he is our maker and everything that we have comes from him, it changes our attitudes. Uh, one example in the Bible uh, that I, I had to think of is Job. Uh, 
Job, he was an extremely rich man, you know, in, in his time. And, and he, was, he was content with what he had, and he lost almost everything. You know, he lost there in Job 1, where he lost his family, he lost uh, his servants, his animals, and his status, I'm sure, too. You know, that, that might be a, a bigger thing to some of us, too. Uh, you lose your status in the community or, or whatever. Um, he lost all, this, all these things, and then ultimately he lost his health, too. Uh, but in the mid, and it all came really fast. Just one after the other, he found out that he lost all this stuff. And, and uh, Job 1, 20 through 22 says, Then Job arose, he rent his mantle and shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So when all this stuff came upon him really fast, I mean, the very first thing that he thought of was worshiping God. And I mean, that's, that's amazing to me. Like you, you see people today going through grief and that's something that I don't know a lot about, you know, what, what a lot of people go through. And to see Job going through all that and still worshiping God. Um, and then later when his friends came to try to cheer him up, you know, it went, it went seven days and seven nights when they were with Job and nobody said a word. Can you imagine that? You know, seven days and nights and they just, and they just sat there uh, because his grief was so great. But then at the end of his life, after he came through all that, Job 42, I want to read verses 12 through 17. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand she asses. And he also, he had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jomima, the name of the second Kizia, and the name of the third Karenhapa. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this, Job, after this lived Job 140 years, and he saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. What I, I guess I never really thought of before, or never really, yeah, never really thought of is in the verse where it talks about, you know, his daughters. It, it says he had seven sons after this, but his daughters, it names them. And also he gave them inheritance along with the brothers. And I think this was Job's integrity, you know, treating everyone the same. And uh, it was just, yeah, it was just kind of amazing to me. Um, so God blessed him greatly twice, but yeah, he also had trials and, uh, and think about it, I guess, if, if right now, you're, if you think about your number one asset that you have, if God would take it right now, would you still be content? Uh, or you could turn that around too. If you think about what you want the most in your life right now, if God would give, give, just give that to you, would you be content? then or would you want something else yet yeah. so it's it's not it's really not about what we have or what we don't have but it's our attitude and what our focus is on by how we answer those questions god wants us to trust him to give us 
what we need, even if it's not always what we want. You know, with our, with our children sometimes, they, they have a lot of wants. They, they want things that we know isn't going to be good for them. And sometimes they don't always get what they want, but we know it's what they need. Um, I'd also like to read First Timothy chapter 6. Verses 5 through 10. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In verse 9 and 10 here, it talks about the people that will be richer. In other words, the people that want to be rich or they have a love of money. I mean, this could be a poor person as easy as a a rich person. Um we can fall into this trap loving things more than God. Um, I worked for a guy uh, down in down in Caddis. This guy has 6,000 acres and it's pretty much all in, most of it is in one chunk and I mean I don't I don't want to be judgmental of him. I don't know if he's content with what he has or not. I, I, I really don't know but I thought about, man, wouldn't this be just amazing to have like this big of a piece of property, you know, that you could do whatever you wanted on and uh, and just to have it. But, you know, sometime, I mean, if the Lord tarries anyway, I'll have the same amount of land as what he has. And, you know, if you really think of it, six by six by three. I mean, that's that's what we're going to both end up with um, eventually. And so it really doesn't matter how much, how much material things that we have. Um, everyone, when they die, everyone when they die are on a level plane. Uh, when they're born, yeah, they're on, they're pretty much on a level plane. But some people can be born into better situations than others, better families than others. Um, but yeah, when we die, we're all on a, a level plane with everyone else. Um, verse 8 there talks about and having food and raiment food and clothes let us therewith be content there's very little actually physically that we actually need there's a lot of things that we want but um, as most of you know my wife and I go to the mountains for usually two weeks or so every, every year and you can you can let we I mean, we live in the mountains, and it's a, a backpack on our back, and we have everything in there that we need. I mean, there's, there's even there's things in there that we don't even need, but you can, you can live like that. And uh, so a lot of times, the things we have is a lot more than what we need. In, in that backpack, we have warmth, we have shelter. I mean, the, that's always not really comfortable, but... It's what it's all that we need, really. Uh, we have food, we have water, and water is something. Just that's just one thing that I'm so much more thankful for. After doing this, like we never even think of it when we go over to a to a faucet and turn the water on. We just we never think of it where it comes from hardly. But when you actually have to look for water, when you find it, you have to filter it, you have to carry it you appreciate that little bit of water a a lot more. Um, And same way with, I suppose, probably none of us thought about taking a breath today. You know, that's just something that we just do 
all the time naturally and never think of it, but I mean, there's some people that really just struggle to, to get a breath. And um, yeah, so it's just something to think about. Um, Not, and another thing I wanted to say, not everyone has to do that to appreciate the small things in life. I mean, but like for me, I, that really helps me appreciate what I have when I, when I do that. And a lot of people do different things. A lot of people go to like third world countries or I, I know I've talked to people that have gone, gone to countries that don't have it as nice as us. And they say when they come back, I mean, it just... Like we have so much here in America and, and we're all, even if we think we're poor, we're really rich compared to probably 80% of people in the world. Um, there's a quote that says, money doesn't buy contentment and poverty doesn't provide it either. And contentment grows over time. It, it doesn't come naturally. You know, it's like, when you when you're preparing for a race there's a lot that you have to put into it you know you have good days of of preparing you have you have bad days that but it takes the good and the bad days to you know to actually be able to run the race and same way in our christian lives there's going to be enjoyable times there's going to be times where you wonder you know is this really worth it and we need to remember it's just like a race. I mean, if you drop out of the race, you don't get a reward at the end. You know, you don't, you don't finish. Uh, same thing in our Christian lives. We've got we to gotta endure to the end and cross the finish line. And sometimes, too, we forget that our side or the Lord's side has already won. I know I've, I've heard someone, someone say this years ago and it really it really made me think like uh, Christ won the victory over sin and death and so Christ's side has already won and and we need to be content in knowing that he has already won it it's kind of almost oh it's not a pet peeve of mine but it's something that I hear people saying a lot like about joining or becoming a Christian, joining the winning side. Well, our side has already won. It, they say like joining the winning side as if it would have a potential of losing, you know, but imagine like a football player, if he would already know that a certain team has won the Super Bowl that year. I mean, you would, all kinds of free agents would just, would go to that team at the beginning of the year trying to sign up. You know, just naturally, of course they would. And, but then how much more sense does it make for us than to join God's side and be content with whatever he has for us? Can we be content without God? I, I don't know, really. I don't, I don't know how to, how to answer that. I mean, we can't be content spiritually. Uh, we can, in our physical lives, we can be happy. Like happiness is an experience, but contentment is a more of a long lasting feeling, I guess. What about our relationships? Are you content with your husband, with your wife? Uh, if you're single, are you content being single with your children, uh, your family? Um, in today's age, I don't, I don't want to bash social media either, but in today's age, like on social media, you see people with these perfect families, you know, and all the good things that they're doing and experiencing and all that. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it, it only amplifies the existing problem that we, that we already have of jealousy and content. You know, if, if that type of thing, you know, makes us jealous or, or discontent, social media only amplifies the problem that we already have. Um, I'd like to turn to book of Matthew also. Matthew 5, verse 6. 
is in the Beatitudes. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, filled with what? I mean, I guess if we're, if we're content in God, it, it doesn't matter what he fills us with, you know, where we go, what he has for us to do. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. I'd also like to read Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are they not much better? Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? You know, like if you're if you're worried that you know, or if you're discontent that you're not tall enough, maybe your looks, your height, uh, you know, we can't we can't change any of that. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow; they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the mor morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. This passage here talks about worry. You know, God, he wants us to plan ahead for the next day, the next week, and, and our future, but he doesn't want us to worry about it. Uh, if his plan is different than the plan that we have, then we should just accept it and be content knowing that his plan is a better one, you know, even if we don't understand it at the time. I'm sure everyone here has had things that they thought the way that their life or certain things were going to go, and it, and it turned out a lot different. And then you can look back and, and say, well, God knew what he was doing. You know, it, I'm, it turned out a lot better God's way than our way. Uh, some questions, too, to ask ourselves. Are we content at our, at our job? You know, we could have an amazing job and, uh, and still not be content with it. What about our health? You know, are, are we content in, in our health? Uh, I know I, I take so much for granted, you know, having good health, and that's, that's another thing you don't even really think about until you don't have it anymore, and then... Yeah, then it's a big deal. Uh, sometimes we don't know why God is allowing health problems that we're going through. I, did, I have to think of one of my teachers in school, Vera. Uh, some of you were related to her. Uh, a lot of you, most of you probably knew her. But she had polio as a child. And uh, she was crippled. It was it was hard hard for her kind of to walk and to, and to do things. But, you know, she... She lived a full, full life where she just, she loved life. She had a big heart. Uh, she loved doing fun things. Like even though that her, with her body she couldn't really do some of these things very good, she at least tried and she loved it. Um, and, and we were really blessed by, you know, what she taught us. And there was... And that probably would have never happened, you know, if she wouldn't have had polio as a child. She probably wouldn't have touched near as many people, I doubt it, because she taught school there for a long time, years and years. Um, are you content with your church? Are you content where you live? 
you know, where, where, God, has, where God has placed you. Uh, I wasn't always. You know, I, I wanted to, at one point I wanted to live out west somewhere and because I love that country. And, but now, but now with what we do going out there, you know, some parts of the year it kind of takes, kind of takes that away. And, and I do, I am content with, with where we live now. Uh, in Philippians, there, well, there's even a verse about that. In Philippians 4, I'd like to read verses 10 through 13. This is Paul talking. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you also you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Um, I know, well, he goes on to say, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Um, I would just... I want to just close, I guess, with a with a chapter about contentment. I know we we always we hear Psalm 23 a lot, but if you if you look at Psalm 23 in the I guess in the context of being contented, I mean it just that chapter just really speaks about contentment um, in God's in God's will for our lives. So I'll just read this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.